Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remember. This is Michael T. Bradley. Pretty momentous moment here, I, I think, for all of us involved. Maybe for some of you out there who've been here from the beginning, you might be like, dude, I thought I thought this we were gonna get here like two years ago, but we, we are here finally. Episode number fifty, explosions and fireworks and everything. Yeah, that's right, episode fifty, and of course and sadly it didn't quite work out uh, as well as it did for uh, end of first and end of second edition, where we're actually hitting the end of third edition at this kind of even number. But we are uh, starting into it. So my thought is is we'll kind of officially end third edition around the I'm I'm guessing the third episode of next block. Unless, of course, I find that there's a trilogy or something that I'm missing that actually took place years and years before, which seems to happen with each block these days. Let's go ahead and end out this block, however. First of all, I want to talk about Realms of the Elves, or just Realms of Elves, whichever it is. Back when this all started long, long ago, I tried reading the Richard Lee Byers story in here because it takes place in, like, negative 10,000 DR or something, and I did not enjoy it. I actually read through that one this time and liked it a lot better, though it really is kind of one of those stories where it's like, well, so? <laughs> you know, I, I guess I just feel... You know, like I've talked about with the one-offs, I feel like you could do anything, you know, so why not do anything? And even more so with short stories, where you have a very limited amount of time. There for a while, we had anthologies where the short stories were kind of continuing stories, you know, like the, the Jander story and um, uh, Tertius, the investigator or whatever. I guess we're done with those now. But, uh, you know, th those were kind of fun because it felt as if you were watching, I don't know, it was like, like an anthology of, uh, uh, you know, and back again, your favorite character. And I enjoyed that. Here we've just got a bunch of short stories where it's like, so I, I read that one, which is like a fifth of the entire book. This is only like five or six short stories, and they're all, well, at least that first one is closer to novella length than short story length. We have one from Eric Scott to be that uh, stars Twilight from that dungeon book, whatever its name was. I didn't really like that dungeon book, and I couldn't get into this one. We have one from Philip Athens that's really underwhelming. Like, it just didn't, nothing here really stood out to me. Maybe that's because I'm not a huge elf fan. I, I don't know. It just nothing really caught me by the throat and, and, and excited me in this mix. On a similar vein, we have The Pirate King by R.A. Salvatore. This is the middle of his Transitions trilogy. I really enjoyed the overall idea here, which is basically watching Luskin fall, or I guess kind of watching a, a plan to make Luskin better fail, if you will. But for my money, it took way too long to kick in. Like, it just, I, I think it was about a third of the way through the book where I just kind of gave up in, in, in reading in depth because I was like, man, there are so many characters and I only really give a damn about one or two of them. And I just, I was like, when is the, when is the damn city going to start its kind of fall into disrepair? And I checked uh, either the last chapter or the epilogue to see if we got another glimpse of 4th edition, because honestly, in the Orc King, the part that I liked the most out of everything was the prologue and epilogue, the hints we got to see of 4th edition, and I found the characters far more interesting there that Drizzt was hanging around with. And and when I glanced at the epilogue in here, which there, there is no 4th edition, it all takes place in, uh, what is it, 1377. And when I glanced in there... I saw that Jarl Axel was mentioned, and I thought, oh, you know, I'd, I'd be curious to see what Jarl Axel is up to and how he plays into this. So I skimmed from where I was in the book, thinking, okay, I'll start reading again whenever Jarl Axel appears, and I skimmed and skimmed and skimmed, keeping an eye out for Jarl Axel. Finally got to the end of the book. Jarl Axel shows up in the epilogue. That's where he comes in, and I, he might have been behind the scenes the whole time. He might have even been in disguise as somebody else, but basically the, the point where you know it's Jarl Axel is the epilogue, and I was like, oh, for God's sake. I, I saw a lot of reviews that basically seemed to be really shocked that this had such a downer ending, but unless I totally was misunderstanding it, because honestly I was not paying that much attention, it, it's really more about the characters paying for their hubris, you know, it's it's like it's like if they had suddenly decided we're going to stamp out racism and Silvery Moon and try to do it by force much earlier in the series, and, you know, that probably wouldn't have ended well either. It's more of that sort of idea than Luskin falls to the bad guys, at least what I got out of it. So, it, you know, it was basically like, and the status quo was upheld. Thank goodness. I, I, I'm going to be excited to read uh, The Ghost King, which I'm assuming is going to push us farther into the future and, and, and uh, 
some things are actually going to happen. I'm, I'm actually weirdly excited for 4th edition Driz. I, I think he's an interesting character, and you could go cool places with him. My fear <laughs> is 5th edition Driz, because from everything that I've seen, they've essentially just reset it so we're back to 2nd and 3rd edition Drizzt, which makes me want to claw my eyes out, but whatever. So that's really all I have to say on that. Moving on, Undead, Part 2 of the Haunted Lands Trilogy by Richard Lee Byers. Now, as I mentioned before, I'm not a fan of the undead. I find zombies boring as hell. I'm not a huge fan of Richard Lee Byers. I have not really connected to anything that I've read by him so far. So... Be prepared to have your socks knocked off here, because I think this might possibly be my personal favorite book that we have read so far. Record Scratch, right there. Record... Right? And you're probably saying, what the hell, Michael, if you are the type of person who talks back to YouTube videos. And let me tell you, this... This novel is... So, the first novel got a lot of uh, knocks from reviewers for jumping around too much. This one, I and it didn't bother me at all. As I say, I really felt like it was pretty obvious who you're supposed to be following. However, if you view that as a detriment, and I, I think it was a detriment simply in the fact that it made it difficult to really connect with the main characters when every now and then you would just be jumping somewhere else. This one, I really like because... We do a certain amount of that jumping around, but it's not a lot. It's not, um, it's, it's just enough to give a flavor of the world that we're in. And that's a big thing that happens here where I really, <laughs> really think that, um, I should have been reading, uh, what's it called? The Empyrean Odyssey first rather than this because, oh, I don't know, very quickly it seemed, very early on in this story, Mistra is killed. Mr. Dies in the background. So, yeah, as far as I know, that happens over in uh, part two of the Empyrean Odyssey. So it's like, whoops. But I, I had already uh, started on it. And I was really into the book. And I was like, okay, well, th there's no real details on how it happened. And this isn't going to jump ahead 10 years. It's all going to be 1385. So my view is that this is just kind of we're still reading it in chronological order, but it's kind of one of those things where next session we'll go back and be like, so how did that happen? You know, we aren't really, like, jumping too far out of order here. So why did I really like this book? Besides the fact that, you know, what? why did I not have a problem with that? Well, here's the thing. First of all, this essentially turns into a post-apocalyptic story, and I, I do have a soft spot for those sort of tales which I think is one of the reasons why I'm excited about 4th edition. Beyond that, it's all so fresh after the Spell Plague that uh, nobody has gained wacky magical powers yet. Right now, they still... And, and it could be that once we get to 4th edition, it won't feel that way. I just... I think I mentioned this before, but the Richard Baker book that I did try, that's very much how the like daily powers and stuff felt to me in 4th edition as opposed to earlier stuff. But here it just felt, it, it felt very much more like how during the time of Troubles, magic was in flux and everybody was uh, trying to deal with it and their powers were out of whack and unreliable. And, and like, for instance, someone does get a wacky new type of magic, but because we're in this period of time where the spell plague is happening, it felt more natural to me. I also just thoroughly enjoyed the relationships in this book. Oh, before I talk about that, though, I'll also say that uh, Byers doesn't just fall back on legions and legions of zombies. I really like the fact that I would say 50% of the monsters in this book were crazy things that I had never heard of before, and I was like, this sounds awesome. Like, there's this one point where... Oh, I wish I could remember what he called it, but it's like some sort of like head that's kind of like a, it's like a giant head, but it's undead. And I, there's some adjective like cloudy or something that's used to describe it that makes it just sound so bizarre. And uh, like it bites off. Or I think it rips off with like these tentacles it has out of its the viscera underneath its neck. I think it rips off the one of the main characters, a female vampire, rips off her head 
And because she's a vampire, they're pretty sure that she can survive this. But after they kill it, they have to, like, get her head out of these flaps inside its mouth. And it's just disgusting. And I just really enjoyed that. Byers, I, I, I did some research on him looking to see if I could find an email address. Uh, as, as I mentioned um, last time, you know, when I, I had said that I uh, tried writing him private message and everything. Byers it has said he's really more a horror writer. And I think here he gets a chance to really show that off. And it, and it shows and it makes his stuff shine so much better. I, I remember the, my favorite thing of his that I've read so far was that short story from the Sembia anthology, Halls of Stormweather, and that was very obviously kind of a Cthulhu riff, and I, I really enjoyed that, and, and this I just loved to death. So let's talk about the relationships. Okay, so basically everybody in here is broken. If you are like me and uh, you loved season five of Angel, where everybody's just walking wounded, especially by the end of the show, you know, I don't think I'm going to say spoiler alert for a show that ended like over a decade ago now, I think. But, um, you know, the end of the show where basically everybody dies, you, you almost feel like it's kind of a mercy <laughs> in a lot of ways because, you know, everybody has just gone through so much hell. I'm going to use that as a segue to open up some of the quotes that I made in here because I made quite a few quotes in this book, many of which I, uh, pertain to the relationships. Oh, apparently I highlighted it so that I would know. I, I, I read this on my Kindle. Uh, so it's at 18% of the way into the book where we get this line. Mistra, goddess of magic, had just perished, and with her death, the weave, the universal structure of arcane forces, convulsed. And that's basically all the detail we get on how her death came about. It's all about dealing with the fallout from that. Okay, so here we are. Here we are to the uh, the quote that I really, really enjoyed. So this is, I, I mentioned the female vampire, and, and she is essentially what has happened to the love of the, the bard from the first book's life. You know, I, I think I remember it in, when talking about the first book that the, there's this bard who's very obviously going to be one of the main characters because he's essentially a good guy and he used to be in an adventuring party. So he went out uh, to join an adventuring party to basically win money to come back and take care of this woman he was in love with. And he comes back and she's been sold and she becomes a, a vampire, except she turns into a flock of bats and she's like super powerful and she's under Sassy's uh, uh, command during the first book. And it's this, you know, whole thing. Here she has, um, because of the spell plague, she has regained her free will, and she's able to break away and join the army that's fighting Sassy. And she and 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 the Bard kind of try to keep pushing each other away because they're different. But they finally break down and have horrifying sex, <laughs> which is awesome. And and so like the thing that starts it is that she starts uh, feeding off of him, and it drives her kind of into lust, and they just like attack each other. And so they're uh, they're arguing about why it, it can't work, and he basically says it won't always be like that. So she says, so she says it would be like that every time. The thirst pushing me, infecting me with a pure, cruel wish to see you die. I trust you. Then you're an idiot. Maybe. And you were right. We aren't the people we once were. We're lesser, tarnished things. And so we can never again possess a love like the one we had before. Yet a bond remains between the people we've become. And why shouldn't we have that? Why shouldn't we see where it takes us and enjoy whatever happiness it can provide? What would be the point of doing anything else? To save your life. I haven't cared about that since the Tsar Keep. I do. She sighed. But if you reach out for me, I won't turn you away. Okay, so guys, I, I just, I cannot tell you how much I love that section, how much I love this relationship. Also, so this is uh, Barreras, Bar something like that. I think it's Barreras. Uh, he's, he's the bard. And also his friendship with Alf is, is very much in the same sort of dire straits in this book. They are, um, there's actually a section that I really enjoyed where, where uh, Ayalf, who's like the head of the Griffin writers, and I guess he becomes the main star of the Brotherhood of the Griffin uh, in 4th edition, but he actually just is like, man, you know, we've been fighting this war for a friggin' decade, I am tired, I'm just gonna 
like go try to start a life somewhere else because I don't really give a shit who wins at this point. And uh, Barreras is like, oh, you know, no, stay. And he uses his bardic influence to screw him over. And then Ail finds out about that later. But A, I really love that somebody was just like, you know, I don't want to be in this horror movie plot. I'm, I'm just going to head out. And B, I love the fact that it really did have consequences and they just aren't ever close friends again throughout this book. And it just, again, it, it, it's this feeling of walking wounded. And with that quote between, um, uh, oh, what's her name? Like Tamara or something like that? Between, uh, Vampirella and Barreras, I just, I, I, I was like, you know, it reminded me of, uh, Debbie's book, Ghostwalker, his, 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 his book Ghostwalker, where the two, the, the love interests knew that their love had to be temporary and it couldn't be this kind of love from the storybooks, but it's like, why shouldn't we pursue it if we can? I, I, there's something about that idea that just really appeals to me, this idea of a love story that's not at all a love story. I've been talking about this way more than I intended to, and I apologize, so let's just kind of quickly go through the remaining quotes. Oh, okay, so my next quote, this is this involves one of the, uh, either the Tharchins or the Zolkirs, I am not really sure what the difference was, and I kind of kept getting it mixed up, but one of the people in power in the, um, uh, the army against Sassy, in fact, Nevron said, you don't have to begin them at all. A fiend bound in the iron bracelet he wore around his left wrist whispered to him, encouraging him, as it often did when he said or did anything that smacked of malice or conflict. So this guy, I don't remember what his deal is. I think they all kind of represent one of the schools, and his is he kind of has all these, like, demons around him or kind of on him in different ways. And I just found these, these little bits that we see of a lot of these characters I really enjoyed because Byers just gives us uh, kind of little hints of, of a lot of characters because there are a lot of characters in this and I thought the way that he represented them was really well done and made you kind of curious uh, to hear more about them. Oh and because here on Realms Remembered we do try to teach a new word when we can I've decided to start marking really good words that I come across Chatoyant. If if you weren't familiar with chatoyant, it means it's an adjective. It means of a gem, especially when cut en cabochon, which I don't know. Showing a band of bright reflected light caused by aligned inclusions in the stone, and it's from the French chatoyer, to shimmer. So essentially, it means shimmering, except shimmering like a gem, I guess. So if you ever see someone write the phrase shimmering like a gem or shimmering in a gem-like manner, you should be like, you ignorant bitch. You should have used chatoyant there. Also, another new word, appurtenance. Appurtenance. An accessory or other item associated with a particular activity or style of living. All the appurtenances of luxurious travel. So there you go. We learned some new words. We had an entertaining book. This is, you know, I'll, I'll, I chalk this up to a win. I kind of talked way more than I wanted to, but maybe through editing I can magically turn it into 15 minutes or less. We're going to talk about 3rd edition as a whole more once we get to the end of 3rd edition since it's coming up so soon here. I am hoping that I can address a lot of the big issues, um, if there were any. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, so I really enjoyed this book. I mean, it's it's kind of, I, I don't know, I, I think that where the Erebus Kale stuff went, it feels like that's not even realms to me. It's just so far above anything else. But personally, I think this one very much could be my favorite book so far. I just really dug it. So I very much uh, uh, encourage you all to do so. Coming up next time, whenever that is, we will be looking at the Imperian Odyssey. We'll go back and see, what was that all about? How'd that happen? And that'll be exciting. For now, this is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.